Well, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Matt Kaufman. I'm a professor in the, at the University of Wyoming in the Department of Zoology and Physiology. And today I'm going to tell you about a little bit of the work that we do here at the University of Wyoming studying big game migrations. So when I came to the university 15 years ago, I didn't come here to study migrations, but I started studying species like this mule deer. And this mule deer is uh, carrying a GPS collar. And so when we capture these animals and send them off into the wild, they're recording locations every couple of hours. And I wasn't prepared for this, but it's always a, su a surprise when we get the data back and see where these animals go. So we put collars on, on elk near Cody, Wyoming. And here are the migrations that those animals made. They moved from, from Cody and the foothills uh, for winter, and then they migrate up into Yellowstone National Park for the summer. The next study I did was on moose in a place called the Buffalo Valley outside of um, Jackson, Wyoming. Again, we, used, we put GPS collars on these animals to study why the population was declining. And we found that they make migrations from that Buffalo Valley winter range also north into, into Yellowstone National Park into some of the same habitats that those Cody elk uh, migrate into. And this is the same type of methodology that was used, used uh, to document what's called the path of the pronghorn, which in this case, uh, you're seeing Grand Teton uh, National Park, and they captured animals in the park, and, and, this is the, and they also put up trail cameras, and this is some of the footage that you get from these animals. So right now you see these animals are moving out of Grand Teton National Park, where they've been all summer. They're coming over um, the pass between the, the Grovance and the Wind River Range, going down to Pinedale, Wyoming, where they, where they will spend the winter. And this tells you a lot about sort of how and why animals migrate. Um, they need to be in sheltered places for winter. They need to be in the mountains for summer to get the best food. So here's that path of the pronghorn migrating up between the, the, the two mountain ranges there into Grand Teton National Park. A lot of our work has focused on mule deer, which are sort of the iconic migrators of, of the American West. And we've done a lot of work in a place called the Upper Green River Basin. Uh, on a couple different populations, one of which migrates up into the Wyoming range. And um, of course, we're collaring, we're capturing and collaring these, these animals. But the other thing we're doing is bringing in other information, especially big data that you can get from remote sensing. And so what you're seeing in, in, in this image here is uh, you're seeing six animals and their, and their movements. But all that green that you're seeing on the map is actually greenness measured from space, from, uh, from satellites. Because one of the things that we've been learning about how these animals migrate is that they do something we call surfing the green wave. You don't need to remember that, but the idea is that as green up goes from Wyoming's uh, plains up into its mountains, the animals follow the green up because when plants are just greening up is when it's most nutritious to them. So uh, we've also asked questions about do animals that surf the green up gain more fat. And uh, this was work that I did with my PhD student, Arthur Middleton here. And Arthur is, uh, they've just captured a wolf. This was a project looking at wolves and elk. Um, Arthur is, is working with uh, Doug McWhorter, who is a biologist with the Wyoming Game and Fish Department. And for our wildlife program here at the University of Wyoming, a lot of our work, all of our work is highly collaboratory. Uh, and we work really closely with the Wyoming Game and Fish Department, but also the Park Service, the BLM, the Forest Service, all the people that in, in Wyoming that manage our wildlife or the landscapes that these animals depend on. One of the things that we do in this work is we, once we capture these animals, we measure their fat reserves. And here you see my colleague, Dr. Uh, Kevin Monteith, who's in the Hobbs School. He's a nutritional expert and he's measuring the fat reserves that these animals have. And so this is the only graph I'm going to show you. Um, and what this graph shows you is that elk that surf better are fatter. So if you're following that green up all the way up to Yellowstone, then you can transfer that into fat. And it's fat that gets these animals through the long, cold Wyoming winter. So some of this research has helped us understand that um, you know, we used to think about the winter range and the summer range. Now we now we've sort of changed our thinking to think about the migration route itself and think of it as its own habitat. Um, Wyoming is also a wide open country with very few people. And so it's a really exciting place to study wildlife because 
they're always surprising us and we're still discovering new things. So in 2011, my colleague Hal Sawyer put um, collars on mule deer that were thought to winter down here in the Red Desert and live there year round. But what they discovered is that not only do those animals not live there year round, but they make the world's longest migration for mule deer, 150 miles. Um, and so, so this has kind of become a flagship for how we understand migrations uh, in Wyoming, but also in the West. And in fact, it turns out that there's three different strategies in the Red Desert, and we're trying to understand the value of each of those. In 2016, we put some new collars on these animals, um, and this technology is really amazing. And I'm embarrassed to say that we can actually sit here in our offices at the University of Wyoming here in Laramie and get updates daily about where these animals are moving across the mountains and plains of the whole state. And that's what we were doing in the spring of 2016, watching this one animal, which you're, which you're seeing here. Um, this animal migrated up the 150 miles like she was supposed to do, but then, and she got to the, to the upper hoback where all the rest of the herd summer, but then she just kept going. She went around the Grovant Mountains, down into Jackson Hole, Wyoming, over the northern part of uh, the Teton, and over to Island Park, Idaho. And so this was kind of exciting for us. We're sort of watching it happen in real time. And we didn't know if this was a dispersal, like we'd lost an animal to Idaho, she fell in with the wrong group, or if, if she'd just broken the record by another 90 miles, because she's made here a 242 mile migration. And we knew we just had to wait for the snow to come and see if it would push her back to the Red Desert. Well, the snow came, but unfortunately her collar failed and we just lost, uh, lost track of her completely. This is my graduate student, Anna Ortega, who spent the next year and a half or so trying to find deer 255 and figure out if she had come back. Um, she never did hear 255. But then in the spring of 2018, we were catching deer again in the Red Desert and the helicopter crew brought in a deer who they couldn't hear, whose collar had malfunctioned, and it turned out it was deer 255. So now she has a fresh GPS collar and we can watch her movements across and, and, and see if she goes all the way back to Island Park, Idaho. And, and I'm gonna show you those movements in just a moment. One of the things, when we see big movements like this, one of the, one of the mysteries has been like, how do these animals do this? How do they navigate? I'm pretty good at navigating around Laramie, but you put me in a new city and you know, it's hard for me to find the best coffee. But these animals seem to be able to do it um, every year, this, almost, almost following in their same footsteps. Uh, a former PhD student of mine, Brett Jesmer, who's shown here, um, realized that we had an opportunity to look at this. And he did this by looking at all of the bighorn sheep that had been reintroduced into Wyoming. So, we lost most of the bighorn sheep in the American West, but for 70 years, wildlife managers have been restoring bighorn sheep, and they often bring them from places where they're migratory into Wyoming into new habitats that they, that they have no knowledge of. And Brett realized that this, was, this could shed some insights into how these animals learn to migrate. And sure enough, um, so all the reintroduced animals had GPS collars, so we could see if they migrated or not. And what Brett found is that sure enough, when they go to their new habitat, even if they were migratory from where they came, they don't migrate. And that's because they don't have the knowledge. And this is a type of animal culture. Um, but over time, over decades, and even up to a century for moose, they can learn to migrate and learn how to, how to make these big movements and then do it the same way every year. Um, this this uh, was, a, was a really important study and it got some got some attention and I, and I love this headline from science writer Ed Yong, humans are destroying an animals' ancestral knowledge. And that is the way we now think about it. We often, in wildlife management, we often think about the numbers, the millions of animals that we lost or that we lose to development, but we also lose the knowledge that they have about how to move on these landscapes. So what about deer 255? I know you've been thinking about her. So here is an animation uh, she did make it all the way back to Island Park, Idaho. And here's an animation that uh, one of my graduate students put together of her fall migration in 2018. 
So remember, she starts in Idaho. Now she's clips the corner of Yellowstone National Park, America's first national park, the world's first national park. Now she moves through Grand Teton. That's Jackson Lake. You can see the Tetons. Now she's in um, the U.S. National Forest, which surrounds the parks. She's moving past the Grovant Mountains there. Now she's about ready to move down into um, the Upper Green Valley. And this is what we refer to in Wyoming as our working landscapes. Um, none of these landscapes or the protected areas are not big enough to contain these migrations. Um, but they exist because Wyoming has big intact landscapes. Um, many of them are, which are um, maintained through ranching, which is consistent with these big migrations. So there she is, she's back down to the Red Desert at her winter range. So Wyoming is a great place to study wildlife because you know, we, have, we have these big mountains that are intact that still harbor most, almost all of the, of the species that were here when Lewis and Clark first um, came through this area. And we're now able to study them and study their, their ecology in ways that just aren't possible in other parts. Uh, of the country. But Wyoming is also changing like lots of parts of the American West. And we've been really interested in understanding how, the, how that influences our migrations. So there's, there's new residential development, there's quite a bit of new energy development, and these create conservation challenges. And so in 2012, we created something we call the Wyoming Migration Initiative here at the University of My Wyoming. And the, the mission statement's on the screen there, but Basically, the goal is we wanted to make better maps and we wanted to tell the public about the migrations that we have here in Wyoming. So through the Wyoming Migration Initiative, we do a lot of work. Uh, we do a lot of cartography. We do a lot of science communication and outreach to help people outside of the university who care deeply about these migrations understand what we're learning about them. So back to uh, the Red Desert to Hoback migration. When we first discovered that, we realized, wow, this is a really complicated place to make a migration. Um, these animals cross three or four different highways. They cross a hundred different fences. And one of the things about working in Wyoming is that it's a small state. So while we're discovering this and researching this, we're also working closely with our partners at the Wyoming Game and Fish Department and the Bureau of Land Management. And they were asking, wow, this is a really important migration, but how do we manage for it? How do we make sure it st sticks around? And so um, we put together really detailed maps of this migration. Uh, in Wyoming, you can get everybody in the same room, which is what we did here, to go through these maps and figure out where the threats were and where the conservation challenges were. And one of those top challenges was a place called Fremont Lake, which you can see on the map here. At this point, the, the migration corridor uh, narrows down to about a quarter mile, and there's four to 5,000 animals that squeeze through between the town of Pinedale, which is this growing western town, and Fremont Lake, which is a deep glacial lake. Those animals either have to swim the lake, or they can cross the lake outlet where it's just a trickle, but then they're on the wrong side of this eight foot high fence. And all of this was complicated by the fact that there was this 360 acre uh, parcel of private land that was creating the fencing. Well, once we mapped this, um, we realized that that private land was for sale and slated to be developed into lakeside cottages, but the conservation fund purchased that and instead turned it into a wildlife habitat management area protected in perpetuity for the migration of these mule deer. And, and here you see folks, uh, biologists with the Wyoming Game and Fish Department and volunteers removing those fences and literally you know, un uncorking this bottleneck. And so this is uh, an example of, of science-based conservation. Uh, we do the work here at the University of Wyoming, but we're working with lots of different partners throughout Wyoming to get that research into their hands so they can make better conservation decisions. And finally, uh, I wanna talk, I wanna step back from Wyoming. Uh, Wyoming has really been a, uh, proving grounds for a lot of the migration work that our team has done. And now we're starting to work with researchers around the world who have the same um, problems. So here you see uh, an elephant, uh, sorry, a, a white-eared cob migration in, in Ethiopia and South Sudan. Again, moving through some national parks, but then through, you know, open country that is not protected. 
the Mongolian gazelle here you see um, make these tremendous movements. Um, but again, they run into fences at the border with, with China and Russia. And there's new railroads that are being proposed that basically aren't considering the movements of, of these migratory ungulates. And then you move to places like Europe. And in Europe, this was kind of eye-opening to me. In Europe, you know, he, he, here on this side, you see an intact migration of red deer. And basically, this is in the Alps, where there are very few people. But in lots of other parts of Europe, like you see here in, in Switzerland and France, this is what the migrations look like. They're short, they're truncated. The animals are still trying to migrate, but there's just so many people that it's really difficult to do. And this work has, um, this work has been really exciting because it's, we're both sort of exporting the work that we do here in Wyoming to other parts of the world and helping them manage their migrations. But at the same time, for me at least, it's given me a deeper appreciation for what we have here in Wyoming because we still have big intact landscapes um, that harbor some of the longest migrations uh, in the lower 48. And it's really exciting work to be able to study them. So I'm gonna leave you with this video of that path of the pronghorn that I showed earlier. There was an overpass uh, put in in 2012 to help these animals get over Highway 189, which was a source of mortality for them. Here you can see them coming down on their fall migration, first hitting the overpass and then moving across it. And um, this is an example of some of the technological solutions that are possible when we have really good science on where these animals migrate and the landscapes they require to do that. So thank you very much. Uh, once again, my name is Matt Kaufman. I'm at the, in the zoology and physiology department. If you have any questions, um, you, can, you can contact me there or um, a lot of our work through the Wyoming Migration Initiative is available at migrationinitiative.org. Thank you. Thank you.